Welcome to the forum three titled Green Technology and its Application. Green technology and its application are crucial for addressing contemporary environmental challenges and fostering a sustainable future by emphasizing the development and deployment of eco-friendly solutions. Green technology aims to minimize the ecological footprint of human activities, whether in energy production, transportation, waste management, or construction. The adoption of green technology mitigates the impact on the environment, thereby reducing pollution, conserving resources, and curbing greenhouse gas emissions. These innovations not only contribute to environmental conservation, but also drive economic growth by fostering industries focused on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable practices. In essence, the importance of green technology lies in its potential to harmonize human development with the preservation of our planet, creating a pathway towards a more resilient and environmentally responsible global society. Our first speaker for the Forum 3 titled Green Technology and its Application is from Jin Zong College of Information, Dr. Dion. I would like to invite Dr. Dion for his presentation, please. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to share this report with you. Today, the topic of my report is Green Agriculture Development and Salinized Soil Control. My name is Duan Yongjian. My major is Physical Geography. Okay, let's begin. In the first part, I will introduce the background of this research. What is salt affected the soil? Saline soil contains an excessive amount of soluble salts. Salt affected soil include both saline and sodic soil. The presence of soluble, soluble salt makes it difficult for plants to absorb water from the soil. What are some common effects of soil salinity? The first one is that saline soil will reduce crop yields. Secondly, saline soil will affect the stability of buildings. Thirdly, saline soil affects water quality in surrounding areas. Finally, extensive soil salination can intensify the process of soil erosion. At present, the global area of saline soil exceeds 833 million hectares, account for 8.7% of the Earth's area. Saline alkali soil are mostly distributed in naturally arid and semi arid areas in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. About 20% to 50% of irrigation on each continent is the soil salinity is too high. It is expected that more than 1.5 billion people around the world will face major challenges in food security due to soil salination in the future. Therefore, we need to pay attention to the special distribution and the influencing factor of saline alkali soil so that we can better achieve sustainable agriculture development. In May 2018, our team went to the Sardaya River Basin for a scientific investigation in Kazakhstan and 375 farmland soil samples were collected in the Kedilord and the Turkestan regions. The picture on the left shows the geographical location of the site area, and the picture on the right shows the location of the simple points. We selected four typical irrigation areas on the Sardar River, namely the Kazalinsk irrigation area, the Kidilord irrigation area, and the northern and southern irrigation area of Sharda. In the second part, I will introduce the research methods for sample processing and analyze in the library. Firstly, remove the animals and uh, plant residues, stones, plastic films, and other debris. Place the collector collect soil sample in a cool, dry, and ventilated room to naturally air dry. Then grind them through a 
millimeter sieve. So samples were analyzed for cations and anions, and the soil pH was also measured. The third part is the results of this study. The soil salt content in the cell dye irrigation area increased significantly from the middle reaches to the low reaches from judging from the grade of saline alkali soil in the irrigation area. The degree of soil sanitation in the cell dye river irrigation area is relatively high. The cations in soil sanity are mainly sodium ions and the the anions are mainly sulfate ions. Cluster analyze groups of variables with similar properties into one category based on the characteristic of the variables and is used to explore the relationship between saline soil and profiles. The results show that the soil sanity profile in the Sardaya irrigation area can be divided into three categories, and surface profile, bottom profile, and the intermediate profile. The surface profile is the most dominant soil profile type in the Sardaya irrigation area. From a special perspective, soil cell content is higher in areas along river. This study chose to use geodetectors to explore factors affecting the special distribution of soil salt content. Geodetector is a tool that uh, measures the degree of special differentiation of special variables and uh, the explanatory um, power of their influencing factors. We selected seven indicators in three categories for study. There are elevation, slope aspect, soil particle size, evapotranspiration, uh, distance from the irrigation canal system and the distance from drainage canal system. The factors with the strong against the explanatory power for special distribution of surface soil sanity in the Catalinsk, Kedelord, and the North and Southern Shardala are evapotranspiration clay content, distance from the irrigation canal and uh, clay content respectively. Set focus on soil sanity in farmland in the Sardaya River Basin. We set a special distribution of soil sanity and the saline alkali soil and uh, explore the factors affecting the special distribution of soil sanity and uh, propose control strategies for saline alkali soil management. In order to better control saline soil, we recommend uh, taking measures from uh, five aspects, including improving water conservation, conservation uh, facilities, and uh, biological improvement, uh, chemical improvement, uh, terrain improvement, and smart agriculture, relax the prevention and the treatment of saline soil. Uh, the results were published in the International Journal Agronomy. Okay, um, that's all. My report is finished. Thank you for your attention. Our second speaker for the Forum 3, Green Technology and its Application. There are two speakers, Dr. Edgar and uh, Dr. Vivian. I would like to request to please share your presentation, please. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Vivian Orejuela, docente del Programa Ingeniería de Sistemas de la Unidad Central del Valle del Cauca, en Tuluá, Valle, Colombia. Nuestra conferencia el día de hoy, los cultivos urbanos verticales como alternativa para reducir la huella de carbono del transporte en Colombia. Me acompaña el ingeniero Edgar de Jesús Sandoval. Los cultivos urbanos verticales, en esencia, son una alternativa de producción lo hacen en bandejas apiladas como si de edificios se tratase, lo cual permite producir una mayor cantidad de alimentos en un menor espacio. Esto es una alternativa ideal para ambientes urbanos. Los beneficios son muchos, pero principalmente la obtención de alimentos libre de químicos, no transgénicos y 100% orgánicos. Hay unos desafíos en la agricultura tradicional, que son la escasez de agua. Con los cultivos urbanos verticales podemos ahorrar hasta un 95% de agua. 
la, el creciente aumento de la población y escasa capacidad de tierra cultivable. Según dato de las Organizaciones Unidas para la Alimentación y la Agricultura, eh, más de la mitad de la población reside en las zonas urbanas y se prevé que esta, esta proporción aumente a un 70% en el 2030. Las ciudades y las áreas metropolitanas representan el 70% de las emisiones mundiales del carbono, así como también el 70% del uso de los recursos. Por lo tanto, la demanda de alimentos en las poblaciones urbanas es cada vez mayor. Otro de los desafíos, y uno de los desafíos pues, más grandes a los que se enfrentan las zonas urbanas, es eh, la cadena de suministro y el transporte de alimentos perecederos en todo el país e incluso en todo el mundo, especialmente donde la tierra es escasa o las condiciones climáticas para producir al aire libre no son posibles. Además, cuando la geografía hace mucho más costoso el transporte de alimentos, esta alternativa se presenta como una alternativa más viable, más segura, con alimentos más eh, libres de pesticidas y herbicidas, consumo menor de agua, menos espacio y así también circuitos de entrega más cortos, por lo tanto, mucho menos contaminantes. Buenas noches, ¿cómo está? Mi nombre es Edgar de Jesús Sandoval, ingeniero de sistemas y pertenezco al programa de Ingeniería de Sistemas. Hoy vamos a hablar de IoT aplicada a la agricultura vertical. La implementación de Internet de las cosas IoT en la agricultura ofrece una posibilidad de interconectar diversos sensores. Cada uno de los sensores permite crear así un sistema integral que recopila todos los datos en el ámbito agrícola. Esto permite a los agricultores automatizar aún más sus procesos en cultivos urbanos verticales. Los dispositivos conectados capturan datos en tiempo real, registrando cualquier evento relevante. Todos estos datos se transmiten a través de Internet, lo que permite eh, una velocidad de transmisión muy alta en cualquier tipo de datos. Todo esto en Internet eh, se transmite a través de un software especializado, lo cual ayuda a agrupar, validar y analizar información, generando un monitoreo en tiempo real. Y diagnósticos integrales de las actividades en curso en los cultivos. El uso de Cloud Computing nos permite o nos proporciona un acceso eh, de grandes recursos de computación bajo demanda. Esto nos permite también llevar una base de datos hacia la inteligencia artificial. A través de esta tecnología podemos ejercer control artificial sobre parámetros eh, de, y sobre todo para poder predecir todo el comportamiento y sobre todo en los cultivos de precisión y de, eh, de cultivos verticales. Eso también nos posibilita la estabilización, control y creación de un ambiente propicio para la producción de alimentos. Además, se logra el uso más eficiente del agua en el proceso agrícola. Dentro de la propuesta eh, infraestructura tecnológica y útil del cultivo vertical urbano en la OCEVA, el proyecto introduce un sistema avanzado de riego aeropónico automatizado respaldado por una infraestructura tecnológica apoyada en el Internet de las cosas, en este caso IoT. También está diseñada específicamente para un cultivo urbano vertical. Lo que nos permite una ventaja muy grande es la reutilización del agua provista en el tanque. Este sistema incorpora tres elementos fundamentales, esenciales, que se integran mediante sensores, abarcando aspectos como temperatura, nivel del agua, iluminación, todos conectados a través de Wi-Fi, protocolos de seguridad implementados a través de sensores SP32 Waterloo. En el ámbito informático se manejan dos escenarios eh, dentro del desarrollo, que son el front-end, que facilita la interacción del usuario, mientras que el back-end se encarga del procesamiento de la entrada y gestiona el acceso a la base de datos. Las soluciones innovadoras no solo optimizan la eficiencia del cultivo, 
sino que también desempeñan un papel crucial en la conservación del agua, contribuyendo así a mitigar el agotamiento de los recursos naturales y a la creciente escasez de alimentos. Otro escenario que manejamos dentro del proyecto es que en este sistema integral permite el almacenamiento, consulta y procesamiento de información en tiempo real, con la capacidad de registrar datos en dispositivos móviles que luego se visualizan a través de gráficos como la temperatura, el nivel agua, el sistema de control IoT también respalda el desarrollo de tecnologías para la agricultura de precisión, contribuyendo a la persever perseveración, preservación de los recursos hídricos y fomentando el cultivo urbano vertical. El prototipo de cultivo urbano vertical incluye una barra de luz LED de crecimiento lineal, una bomba sumergible y un sensor de nivel de agua analógico. Al ubicarse en zonas urbanas, elimina la necesidad de transporte, lo que permite reducir así la huella de carbono. Our third speaker is from University of Autonomous Mexico, Dr. Jemena. I would like to request Dr. Jemena to please share her research findings. Hi, my name is Jimena Barrientos, and I'm going to present my master's project that's called Effect of Biological Pretreatment and Co-Digestion with Bovine Manure for Enhancing the Anaerobic Digestion and Biomethane Yield in Sargassum Natans and Sargassum Flitans. This project was carried out in the Institute of Engineering of UNAM by the direction of Dr. Adalberto Noyola Robles. Sargassum Natans and Sargassum Flitans are two species of brown macroalgae that are found floating in the surface of the sea. Um, these have a positive impact in open sea since they are refuge of a lot of species and they absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, in recent years, they have formed a new phenomenon of accumulation that's called the sargassum belt. This was reported since 2011 and it's caused uh, due to the increase of nutrient discharge to the oceans and the climate change. The negative impact of sargassum is in the coasts since they uh, decompose there and liberate a lot of toxic um, gases. Also, they cause death of a lot of marine species and they have uh, impacted negatively the tourism that's the primary source of income in the Caribbean. And that's why the valorization of sargassum has been uh, intended in the past years, and it has and sargassum has been used in the construction, uh, also in the food and pharmaceutical industry, in bioremediation, and as a fertilizer. In this project, we propose to use sargassum to produce biogas uh, by anaerobic digestion and get a um, benefit from this um, biomass, uh, producing, producing bioenergy and also a dig digested that can be used as fertilizer. To know if a biomass is suitable to produce biomethane, there's a um, test that's called biochemical methane potential that uh, tells us the methane yield and the biodegradability of a biomass. Since the biomass tends to be recalcitrant, this is due to the polysaccharides in the biomass that inhibit the hydrolysis. That's the first step of the anaerobic digestion. If the hydrolysis is inhibited, the um, production of methane is low. In sargassum, there's a lot of polysaccharides as there is lignocellulose and alginate, and also it has a lot of ashes that's also a recalcitrant um, thing in the biomass. The, that's why pretreatments have to be adjusted and, uh, and coupled to the um, anaerobic digestion process. And in this project, we propose to use biological pretreatments because they pose the advantage that they degrade many types of polysaccharides. There, there is a fast process 
and they require low energy. Also, co-digestion is a way of diluting inhibitors, uh, neutralizing pH and in the process of anaerobic digestion, and it has the benefit that it does not increase the process costs. Uh, using bovine manure as a co-digester um, has the positive impact that they have hydrolytic microorganisms that can also um, degrade the polysaccharides in the biomass. The ju justification of this project is that um, sargassum is having a negative impact in the coast of the Caribbean, and uh, we need to remove it and utilize it to, and we can utilize it to produce biogas by a process of anaerobic digestion. But this is um, a challenge since there are a lot of polysaccharides in the biomass. That's why pretreatments and carbo digestion could increase the production of biomass of biogas in from sargassum. And so the objective of this work is to increase the hydrolysis yield and methane productivity of sargassum natans and sargassum flitans by applying biological pretreatment and co-digestion with bovine manure. Um, the experimental design was to do BMP tests in which we had different treatments. We used fresh sargassum, sargassum that was micro microbially or enzymatically retreated and also co-digested with bovine manure. And we uh, measured the methane yield in these, different, in these different treatments. The result were the following. Um, fresh sargassum, when it was coupled with bovine manure, the um, methane yield was increased by, by 37%. When fresh sargassum was coupled with microbial pretreatments, the, the yield did not improve. When fresh sargassum was sterilized, the methane yield was decreased by 42%. And when sterile sargassum was pretreated with an enzyme that's a cellulase, uh, the change in methane yield was of 79% increase. Um, when it was coupled with an alginate lias, the improvement in methane yield was only 7%. What we conclude is that sargassum and anaerobic digestion alone does not lead to the desirable biogas production at an industrial level, but it constitutes a way to use sargassum biomass, removing it from the coasts and obtaining biogas and a digestate that can be used as fertilizer. There's also ways to improve the um, methane yield um, from sargassum without increasing the cost of the process. For example, it is desirable to perform co-digestion in this work by using bovine manure as co-digester, hydrolytic microorganisms are provided and the anaerobic digestion process is stabilized, generating 37% increase in methane yield. In this work, we used five times more sargassum than bovine manure because that's the biomass we want to use. And well, there's a lot of ways we can keep improving this methane yield from sargassum, and we want to keep exploring it. Uh, I want to thank all the team in the laboratory and the CONACYT and the Laboratory of um, Environmental Engineering of UNAM. Thank you. Our fourth speaker is from South China Agriculture University, Dr. Kon Zheng Kai. I would like to request Professor to please share his research finding, please. Hello, my name is Kun Zheng Cai, come from Natural Resource and the Environment, South China Agriculture University. Today, I will discuss about ecological secular agriculture and the green Development. And I will talk about uh, four aspects. First, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, some issue about the problems about agriculture. 
Uh, second, how to transform from the conventional agriculture to the ecological agriculture. Then I will take some examples for the uh, ecological agriculture uh, technologies. And the last one, say some policy and the law regulation. And we know uh, Chinese green production have made great progress, but this kind of progress is depend on the higher input, for example, high irrigation, higher chemical, higher pesticide, higher fuel. And uh, we use a lot of uh, inputs. So there's some problem, for example, the environmental problem, and also the monoculture have some uh, lower biodiversity. <clears throat> And another is agriculture is also have some uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, for example, for the rice, for the fertilizer, for the end production, agriculture contributed more than 13% of the greenhouse gas emission. So what's the agriculture green development? This is to coordinate the environment protection with the development to realize the transformation of current agriculture with the higher resource consumption and the higher environmental costs to a green agriculture, it means sustainable agriculture. So we have four levels to transform. First, maybe we just reduce the chemicals to increase the efficiency. Second, we can repla replace the chemical with some biological organic the third one, we can design the agro ecosystem to increase the biodiversity, for example, the intercropping, rotation, agroforestry. The last one, we, be, we may connect from the uh, growers to the eaters to retain the quality of sustainability. So, for example, the biological uh, diversity use uh, for the landscape or for the we integrate different crops according to their trees and to utilize the land the light on some other kind of resource this example for the rice field uh, we can integrate the rice with some animals for example the duck the fish the shrimp and also we can keep some uh, grass in the garden to increase the uh, biodiversity. But uh, you may be asking how to realize the mechanization because this intercropping is, will uh, take a lot of uh, human labor. So we can have two methods to, reduce, to realize this problem. First one, we can design some specific machine for this in the cropping. Uh, for example, this submachine is from Japan. They just uh, uh, invented some machine to suitable the traditional in the cropping. Another one, we can design the strip in the cropping for the uh, current machine. Uh, for example, we can maybe not only one, uh, two to one, maybe two or uh, four to two, uh, six to three to make the strip in the cropping then it will be suitable for the machine. So how about the nutrient uh, management? Uh, we can integrate the irrigation and the fertilizer, and also maybe we can use the liquid fertilizer to reduce the water, to reduce the uh, fertilizer input, to increase the nutrient efficiency. And also we can use some new type of fertilizer. For example, this is use the coating fertilizer to uh, uh, make the, the, the nutrient uh, slowly slow release. And also maybe we can use the uh, uh, biochar integrated the, the fertilizer to increase the efficiency. And how about uh, the crop production and the animal farming? We can integrate, use the uh, biogas uh, to uh, integrate these two parts. So use biogas to use the, the leaves, the waste is coming into the biogas tank. And uh, the biogas, the liquid, the solid can uh, return to the plant field. And this is another example in some fruit garden. Uh, you see this pig farm, uh, this is uh, uh, fruit and they use biogas integrated two parts. So another issue I will see uh, use some uh, new methods to for the uh, control for the disease. 
Uh, here, I instead, I talk about the anaerobic soil defensation uh, for the soil borne disease. Uh, to instead of the chemical control, first, we can use some carbon source, for example, straw, rice brown, intercropped the soil, and then we irrigation. After that, we will do matching to create an anaerobic condition to uh, kill the soil borne disease. So this is use this technology to control some soil bone disease. So the first they use for the strawberry, second is for banana, the third one is a chili to control the soil bone disease, use the ASD. So how about the greenhouse gas emission? We just use rice as example uh, for the rice because it is uh, emit a lot of messy CH4. So we can have some strategy, for example, the water management use the mid season drinker or protobin the drinker or use the wet drying uh, irrigation. And we can also uh, optimize the fertilizer to reduce the uh, fertilizer use. And we can use some organic matter, for example, the straw removal, use biochar, use a menu. And also we can breed, use some new varieties to reduce uh, this uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, but but uh, not only the technology, uh, but also we use some uh, policy and even law methods. Uh, in China, we have three kinds of food system. First, we call the basic is the seafood. A second is the green food. We have green food A level, green food AA level. Green A level is close to the organic food. But green A level, we can use some specific fertilizer, some specific, specific uh, pesticide. <clears throat> so for this food system, we can ecological agriculture, we can also use some policy to integrate the, for this system. We have maybe have some intervention by the human activities to increase some um, um, positive effects to reduce some negative effects. For example, for some ecological sound practice, we will uh, encourage it. For example, reduce the taxation. The government have some investment, have some award, and uh, take some lower and reduce some interest rate. For some ecological wrong practice, so we maybe increase the taxation. Maybe we increase the charge for pollution and resource. And also maybe we higher interest rate to deal with those wrong practice for the agriculture. <clears throat> so this is what I want to uh, talk about uh, uh, from the conventional agriculture to a sustainable agriculture. Okay, that's all, thank you. Our fifth speaker is from Jin. Hong College of Information, Dr. Zhang. I would like to request Dr. Zhang to please present his research. Thank you. Flower arrangement as a kind of cultural activity of human beings has a long history. It has a history of 2000 years in both the East and the West. In flower arrangement, people can plant materials through artistic processing and give them cultural connotation which has been developed into a unique art called flower arrangement Chahua in China, Ikebana in Japan, and floriculture in European countries and USA. Flower arrangement art is a three-dimension art which is different from graphic arts like calligraphy and painting. Unlike sculpture and architecture, it is a living three-dimension art Therefore, artists must not only follow the laws of aesthetics to create artworks, but also absorb the essence of literature and give spiritual connotations, perhaps the plant physiological and ecological characteristics, rational processing and proper performance so as to extend the viewing period. In this sense, flower arrangement art integrates art with techniques. Flower arrangement art is both a discipline and a creative industry. 
The flower arranger must not only master the knowledge of composition, color, plant, literature, and the like, but also gain some understanding of materials, optics, mechanics, and the like. Only by combining his or her own understanding can the flower arranger create good works. Functions of art of flower arrangement Environmental function Softening space People are in touch with more hard-edged objects such as architecture, furniture, and others in their living space. The vision is single and blunt. Decorating graceful flower arrangement can make people's vision pleasant and buffering. Bring vitality to the environment. In working or living environment, people are exposed to many inorganic substances. Arranging some living flower arrangement works can add vitality to environments. Especially in winter, outdoor environments are in all depression. Indoor environments are furious spring, which bring people a vibrant feeling. Optimizing life. Flower arrangement is a refined art and a soft decoration of family and working places. In working or living environments, flower arrangement works can protect eyes, regulate mood, and enjoy nature. Cultural function. Inheriting national excellent culture. Chinese flower arrangement art is a basic and important part of the Oriental flower arrangement. It is also the quintessence of Chinese culture. Popularity and improving Chinese flower arrangement art is good for carrying forward our national excellent traditional culture and developing national culture. Cultivating mind. Flower arrangement is an elegant culture activity that pursues the truth, the goodness, and the beauty. Both creation and appreciation of flower arrangement are beneficial for cultivating people's graceful living interests and pursuing noble behavior standards through flower arranging formal beauty and edification of artistic conception beauty, improving culture and artistic accomplishment. In the process of learning and creating flower arrangement art, People will continuously enrich composition, colors, plants, knowledge of literature, and poems. With the accumulation over time, flower arranging levels are improved, and culture artistic accomplishment will be improved accordingly. Emotional function. Flower is the most beautiful symbol in the world. People send flowers to express their friendship, affection, love, and even universal love for the whole country in different festivals or at a special time. Flower plays an irreversible part in people's emotional life as lubricant. It is flowers that serve people as emotional messengers yesterday, today, and tomorrow. With the continuous improvement of people's living standards, people in the urban concrete forest are eager to embrace and return to nature. And the horticultural therapy become the emerging product of modern garden horticulture. Horticultural therapy, in a broad sense, is a therapy that promotes physical strength, physical and mental recovery therapy through plants and plant-related activities through horticulture as a medium and people as objects. Planting flowers and grass has been regarded by the public as a means of decompression rehabilitation. As a subordinate of horticultural therapy, Flower therapy is an effective method through flower arrangement and related activities to adjust and update the social, educational, psychological, and physical aspects of flower arrangement and related activities. Flower therapy is an effective way for urban and rural residents to adjust and decompress their lives. In life, people will feel angry, hot-tempered, sad, sorrowful, but most people see flowers, the soul will naturally get a spontaneous, inexplicable comfort. China has a long tradition of horticulture, house culture. The implementation of flower therapy emphasizes more experience, which is to feel the stimulation of plants to people, not to pursue perfection, but to pursue the fun in the process of implementation. 
Floriculture has become a new force in the development of horticultural therapy in China and plays an important role in improving health and quality of life. The art of Chinese flower arrangement has always followed the tradition of natural aesthetics and paid attention to the theory that man is an integral part of nature. In the long history of more than 2,000 years, Chinese flower arrangement as a cultural symbol has become a rather elegant art form with its unique style, enriched people's yearning for a better life. Participating in floriculture activities and creating floriculture works can reduce heart rate and relieve bad emotions and have great help for people's psychological and physical recovery. Flower arrangement involves the process of conception, picking, planting, and shearing. First of all, ideation itself is a process of letting oneself calm down. Tranquility is the best condition for physical and mental self-repair. Think about what kind of flowers you want to plant today, what kind of vase to choose, how many colors to use, what's the styling like, what kind of thing will you express, and so on. The process of ideation is actually the process of allowing yourself to focus on one thing, flower arrangement. After the idea is complete, whether you go to the florist to buy flowers, or pick flowers in the surrounding environment, or even go to the mountains to pick flowers, that kind of mood, especially the mood of picking flowers in nature, is relaxed, pleasant, and the best comfort for the body and mind. It's simple because you are dealing with something really beautiful. Even a florist in a tall building, busy downtown, when you are faced with colorful flowers, the fragrant charm will make it easy for you to leave all your worries behind. Arrangement process, you have to carefully cut, make, change the position until you finish a work that you are satisfied with. In this process, it is impossible to do two things unless you are inserting the same kind of commodity flowers. During the arrangement process, you will find that you will easily mingle with the flowers. With the continuous improvement of your aesthetics and the continuous proficiency of your arrangement skills, the flowers in your hands will cooperate more and more with you and run to the position you need very tacitly. Your tired body and mind will be recovered in this harmonious feeling. Finally, it's time to share. Moving works will resonate with the audience. Beautiful works will make everyone happy. Excellent works will leave you with endless memories. In short, as long as you make the work with your heart, there will definitely be something touching about it. You will get the greatest self-satisfaction in the feedback of compliments. And this feeling of happiness is a healing elixir that is hard to buy. That's all. Thank you. Our next speaker for the Forum 3, Green Technology and its application, is from Shandong Agriculture University, Dr. Xiong Wang. I would like to request Dr. Wang to please share his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to share my topic with you. Then I'd like to talk about uh, control of southern root knot nematode on tomato used in soil amendments. First, I will introduce the background. As we know, root knot nematode lives and feeds in the roots of various plants. And the most susceptible crop is tomato. Root knot nematode has a stylet, a hollow retractable needle connected to esophagus and three unicellular 
is a uh, is a federal glands. This structure is used to piece and penetrate plant cell walls. To release its federal secretions into the host tissue, and to take up nutrients from the giant cells, which have several nuclei. So, root not nematodes infection symptoms include root galls, short chlorosis, deficiency of nutrients, dented growth, and wilting. The research found that about 2,000 plants are sus susceptible to infection by those nematodes, and they are causing severe crop yield losses worldwide. Second, method of root knot nematode control. In view of the adverse impact, it's important to manage the root knot nematode infestation. There are several strategies for the control of the root knot nematode. One, use chemical nematicides. Chemical nematicides are popular for their quick response. Nematicides are artifi uh, artificial solutions made for the control. Also, they start giving feedback as soon as after the application. The damage to the crop itself and also side effects associated with the human health. So, the use of chemical Nematicide is being limited. Two, rotation with antagonistic plants or grafting. The antag uh, antagonistic feature of those crops has highly reduced the nematode population. Three, you different by control agents. Biological agents like phage, bacteria, actinomycetes, and others are host specific and have the potential to kill the plant parasitic nematodes. Four, organic amendments for the control. In the literature, many trials of organic amendments like crop waste. Compost, manual, agro industrial waste, different extracts and chopped leaves are used by different researchers as organic additives to improve crop yields and suppress the root disease. Organic materials may be animals and plant origin. Now, uh, I will introduce two kinds of amendments. One is the waste of a kind of medicinal insect, Eupolifuga. The other is a plant-based product, then succulum, bentonum seeds. One, you polyphaga rice and its extracts protected tomato from melodogy in incognita infestation. This topic mainly takes uh, the, uh, the phrase as material. The country effects of, of phrase and its uh, extract on um, not nematodes were studied through laboratory assays, potty parments, and field trees. The new trees, organic, volatile compounds, and uh, oligokitsin 
contents in the phrase were analyzed. From the pictures, we can see that the nematode ability and mortality was significantly increased with increasing extract concentration and treatment time. And uh, the egg hunting was significantly inhibited when the extract concentration has beyond 20%. Through hot experiments, it found that the goal index decreased significantly, and in the soil, the number of root knot nematodes were obviously reduced after adding your polyphagor press. The ingredients analysis showed that organic matter and uh, humic acid content is 19.3% and 8.85% uh, respectively. Micro elements and uh, micro elements are rich in fresh. There are 18 essential amino acids and uh, more than 100 kinds of volatile compounds. Also, we found uh, the content of oligoketism was about 4.4%. As we know, oligoketin is derived of cotton that is part of insect constitute has a nematy side effect. Those natural uh, cartoners material are potential as substitute to synthetical nematicides since they are also abundant and less harmful to the environment. Two, control of southern road knot nematode on tomato and regulation of soil bacterial community by, by fumigation with uh, then Soxylum benjamin seeds. We use field experiments in the greenhouse to determine the effect of the seeds on southern road knot nematodes. Plant growth parameters, soil physical, chemical, and um, microbial characteristics. As the chart and the pictures showed by fumigation with the seed had a significant effect on controlling the root knot nematode. And uh, also we found that there are 20 uh, six kinds of volatile compounds and uh, some of the volatile substances were previously reported as having insecticidal activity. As shown in the fingers, by fumigation of the benjamin seed provided favorable living conditions for those 
microorganisms to accumulate in the following period in the treated habitat. And the co-occurrence network of bacterial communities was reconstituted tilted by, by fumigation of the seeds. In conclusion, although the use of organic amendments for if effective nematode control is limited by the larger quantities needed, they can reduce nematode population density to different. In addition to their suppressive effect on nematode density, organic amendments stimulate microbial populations of actinomycetes, bacterial, and phage, elements of which might be antagonistic to nematodes. Meanwhile, organic amendments provide better media for plants to grow, resulting in bad soil texture, increasing water holding capacity, supply the nutrients to deficit soil. Organic soil amendments have been used successfully as effective alternative environment-friendly methods for culturing the root knot nematodes. That's all. I'm very glad to be here to share my results with all of you. Thank you for your kind attention. Thanks. Our next speaker is from National University of Sciences and Technology, Dr. Rashid Iftikhar. I would like to request Rashid Iftikhar to please share his presentation. Hello, I would like to welcome you all to this video presentation on World Green Science Day. I am Dr. Iftikhar, a biogeochemist, and in today's presentation, we will explore the role of microorganisms to solve key environmental problems, trends, challenges, and the way forward. Each of us shares our air, food, water, and shelter with tiny colonies of microorganisms that include viruses, bacteria, and fungi. We are already familiar with their role as decomposers that recycle the dead, as producers of oxygen that we breathe, as primary producers that control and feed the world and as protein resource to treat domestic and industrial wastewater. As good microbes in and on our body to prevent us from harm such as keeping our skin healthy and as fixers of atmosphere nitrogen that is needed for building DNA, RNA and protein molecules. A key interlinking factor of many global issues including climate change is the use of poor practices that are not environment friendly and mismanagement of our remaining natural resources. Recently emerging applications of microbial biotechnology have demonstrated the potential to solve some of these challenges as well as providing a source of sustainably produced feedstock for product development. A few of these applications include use of bacteria that could quadruple the speed of sewage processing. These are the bacteria that grow their own electrical wires to help them survive in harsh environments and are now helping us in transforming how we process sewage. Applications of bacteria that turn trees into pollution-eating machines 
attacking trees by adding bacteria to their roots to develop symbiotic relations that could help scrub a contaminated soil clean of chemicals and metals coming from industries as a gentle remediation process. Next is the milking of microbes for renewable energy that could help replace fossil fuels. Scientists have now found a way of producing fuel for cars from microalgae, and scaling up these techniques could create a reliable source of renewable energy. Also, living buildings that could use bacteria for heat, electricity, and repairs. Inserting bacteria into bricks and concrete could help designing innovative construction materials that could transform bricks into living buildings with a reduced environmental footprint. These were just a few examples. Many of the applications of these microbes are already in practice, such as biofuel production. Let's take the example of microalgae species. Its biomass is rich in carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. In addition to these, microalgae are capable of producing a broad range of pigments, including chlorophylls, phycobilly proteins, and carotenoids and a diverse range of secondary metabolites. Their potential applications include treating wastewater, utilization for biofuel and biogas production, use as biofertilizers and biostimulants in agriculture, biomass use as feedstock for fishes, and apart from this, the intracellular pigments and proteins can be utilized in cosmetic, food, pharmaceutical, and processing industry for diverse reasons from as a colorant to produce bioplastics to as a resource to develop novel anti-cancer drug. Although the emerging applications of microbes demonstrate the potential of these organisms to assist with the achievement of sustainable development goals. Several barriers exist that need to be overcome to ensure that microbial biotechnology can assist with sustainable development in practice, such as production optimization, cost-effective, large-scale cultivation, and substantial investment. There is a dire need to overcome with the programs like Living Building Challenge by Living Future Institute to fast track the roadmap to green sustainable practices. Thank you. Any questions, please? Our last speaker for this particular session is from Autonomous Mexico State University, Dr. Moise. I would like to request Dr. Moise to please share his research findings. Buenos días a todos. Soy el Dr. Moisés Tejocote Pérez, investigador de la Universidad Autónoma del Estado de México, del Centro de Investigación en Ciencias Biológicas Aplicadas. Hoy les vamos a presentar el proyecto de economía verde y economía circular, eh, derivado de una patente eh, con registro MXU 2016-00294, registrada en México, y que de esta patente se desprende ya una planta industrial eh, a nivel prototipo, denominada como planta deshidratadora de alimentos funcionales y de economía circular verde. Esto inició hace cinco años, eh, con el desarrollo del prototipo del desecador para materia orgánica que utiliza termodeshidratación avanzada desarrollado por su servidor y patentado ante el INPI en el 2019. Es un e e equipo que trabaja a bajas temperaturas y hace una deshidratación hasta del 92% de pérdida del peso fresco de los alimentos. Es decir, por cada tonelada de alimento obtenemos 
100 kilogramos de eh, deshidratado, ya sea en forma de chips, hojuela, rodaja, filete o pulverizados en forma de harina. Eh, todo esto nos ha permitido desarrollar diferentes prototipos a nivel de pulverizados o encapsulados para alimentación funcional. Se han hecho pruebas pilotos sometidas tanto a mercados locales como a mercados internacionales y nos ha permitido desarrollar un esquema de negocios tanto a nivel eh, individual como a nivel industrial, siendo proveedores de materias primas para diferentes industrias del sector agroalimentario aquí en el Estado de México. Hemos desarrollado dos productos con aplicación alimentaria funcional a nivel industrial y consumo personal, que es la seta termodeshidratada y la carne de conejo termodeshidratado. Tenemos una capacidad para desarrollar hasta 11 prototipos bajo este esquema, que son derivados de hojas de maíz, cabello de lote, nopal, aguacate, guayaba, jitomate, plantas medicinales, frutos rojos, carne de pollo, carne de res y carne de cerdo. Con este esquema hemos logrado construir el primer modelo de transferencia verde en comercialización de productos funcionales con esta tecnología de termodeshidratación avanzada y transferencia de conocimiento. Las dos eh, prototipos que tenemos ya bajo un esquema de comercialización es la seta termodeshidratada y la carne de conejo. Tienen un, hasta un 90% de eficiencia en peso y pérdida de eh, humedad. Al, al deshidratar de esta forma, nosotros preservamos eh, grupos funcionales nutrimentales, sobre todo aquellos como son inmunofortificantes naturales, antioxidantes como flavonoides, alcohol, alcaloides, fenoles, glucósidos terpentenos, entre otras sustancias de importancia eh, nutrimental como son vitaminas, proteínas. Tanto en la forma proteica como lo son los hongos, como en la, en la carne de, de origen animal, se hace el preservado de las mismas propiedades funcionales. Eh, eso hace que se conviertan en alimentos que con una cantidad pequeña y al concentrarse tengan la funcionabilidad al 100% de poder transmitir sus nutrientes y sus beneficios en el metabolismo, principalmente en el metabolismo humano. Por lo tanto, no son aditivos, no son fármacos ni son medicamentos, son alimentos. Es un aditivo que se incorpora a los alimentos de manera nutrimental y lo hace mediante una dieta diaria de ingesta. El proyecto ha sido avalado de manera nutrimental, de manera médica, en medicina del deporte y también ha sido avalado por la eh, UNESCO, eh, que es una dependencia de la ONU, como en el, eh, un producto o un, un esquema de negocios que es amigable con la producción de energías limpias y renovables. También contamos con el aval de la Fundación Internacional de Innovación y Desarrollo de la Unión este, Europea, denominada FITMAN, que en abril del 2023 nos otorgaron eh, el apoyo para poder ser una, un modelo de transferencia de tecnología y de producción en Europa y en países de Asia. Nosotros tenemos un comparativo siempre entre nuestros productos termodeshidratados y los productos comúnmente utilizados, tanto en forma de proteína o en forma de eh, verduras y, y vegetales, eh, hacen todos estos beneficios que va desde la preservación química de los nutrientes hasta la mejora en la alimentación y de la digestión de los mismos. Tenemos un plan de asociación ya desarrollado como centro de investigación en nuestra planta piloto, un modelo de negocios que va a un 56% de inversión por parte de nuestra universidad, por ser un proyecto universitario, un 22% para socios comercializadores y un 22% para socios productores. Este esquema es para hacer la transferencia del modelo, tanto a nivel local como a nivel internacional. Con este esquema de negocios 56, 22 y 22%, nosotros obtenemos una fortaleza en nuestro análisis FODA de poder implementar un esquema de economía verde a nivel internacional, mejorando la producción, las ganancias, sobre todo de productores locales, generando una cadena de comercialización, aumentando el valor agregado de los productos y mejorando la alimentación actual de la humanidad. Nuestras estrategias van desde una estrategia táctica, operativa y competitiva, basada en una política verde, en preservación de los recursos, un buen manejo de las áreas agrícolas y una buena producción de alimentos funcionales con un respaldo científico. Tenemos también nuestra diferencia competitiva a, con otros productos que son ampliamente comercializados, 
eh, porque somos un, un producto que va eh, en el esquema de eh, harinas, en el esquema de eh, deshidratados, en el esquema de alimentos y en el esquema de eh, bases para materia prima para la producción de alimentos en casa. Por lo tanto, hemos hecho un estudio eh, en euros para la Unión Europea, donde ya se hizo el primer modelo de transferencia de tecnología, en donde tenemos una capacidad de producción con este esquema hasta de 4 toneladas eh, de deshidratación de materia prima fresca en una semana. Nuestro modelo piloto que contamos con en el laboratorio es de una tonelada por semana. Por cada tonelada obtenemos 100 kilogramos de deshidratado. Al deshidratar nosotros bajo este esquema mejoramos la tasa de logística, es decir, eh, por la, el transporte y el almacenamiento de, de alimentos perecederos mejoramos el, no, hasta el 100% de gastos en refrigeración y en transporte para eh, la distribución de estos alimentos. Tan es así que nuestro esquema de negocios que fue avalado por la Unión Europea forma parte ya de un candidato como proveedor para la alimentación futurista en la Luna y en Marte ante la Agencia Espacial Mexicana y la NASA. Eh, nosotros tenemos un costo de ganancia, por ejemplo, para el caso de Z deshidratada, de 241 pesos, que equivale a 12.29 euros para su comercialización, teniendo una ganancia de 3 euros por costos de kilo de producción y gastos de comercialización y teniendo una tasa de retorno de inversión del 60% por kilo de deshidratado, que estos son 180.72 pesos, que equivaldría a 9.21 euros. Esto nos da un esquema de negocios que, de acuerdo a nuestro valor y nuestra estructura de costos y nuestra fuente de ingresos, podamos tener una ganancia hasta de un 65% por cada kilo de venta de este tipo de alimentos. Eso mejora mucho las condiciones de producción y la distribución. Eh, por lo tanto, nuestra meta como modelo de negocios es tener una inversión eh, en, en euros, en este caso de 355,780 euros, para poder tener una perspectiva de 20 toneladas como producción al mes. Esto uniendo fuerzas y teniendo un, este, un esquema de transferencia de tecnología a nivel industrial y a nivel nacional para, e internacional para poder ser más competitivos y poderlo implementar en todo el mundo. Por lo tanto, es importante darles a conocer esto como países latinos para podernos unir y poder hacer esta transferencia en otros países de Latinoamérica para dar beneficios a sus productores y mejorar la economía. Con este esquema de negocios, nosotros al mes producimos 16 toneladas, produciríamos eh, una tonelada y media de, de cantidad de deshidratados con una utilidad de hasta de 147.467 euros, que a 24 meses incrementaría la ganancia de 3.539.220 punto 40 euros. Esto hace ser que sea un modelo de negocios altamente rentable para la economía nacional e internacional. Este es nuestro equipo, somos un grupo interdisciplinario de profesionistas y especialistas comandados por su servidor como responsable técnico del proyecto, la parte de control de calidad, operación logística, administración y finanzas, comunicación y vinculación. Somos un modelo de réplica, somos un modelo que está dispuesto a colaborar con todos los países de Latinoamérica para el beneficio y la alimentación funcional de la humanidad. Muchas gracias a todos.